Good afternoon, and welcome to our second McDougall Global, Global Perspectives Lecture Series talk. Um, we're very pleased to have with us this afternoon Professor Gregory Bowman, who has been a visiting professor here with us at West Virginia College of Law for the last two years. Um, Professor Bowman is an associate professor of law at his home institution of the Mississippi College of Law. And while he's been there, he's done tremendous work to expand their international programs and international offerings. Um, as you can see on the board, uh, some of his uh, more notable accomplishments have included founding and directing its International Law Center, establishing and directing the Korean Summer Legal Studies Program there, and also organizing and directing its International Speakers Series. Um, we're pleased to have Professor Bowman with us, not only because he is um, a tremendous scholar and uh, writer in the area of international trade and international law, as well as national security, but also because he was born and bred right here in West Virginia and graduated summa cum laude from West Virginia University with a degree in economics and international studies. Um, he was also a member of Phi Beta Kappa here at WVU. Professor Bowman then went on to receive his master's degree in economics of the European community with distinction, which is top honors, from the University of Exeter in England. He then went on to Northwestern University School of Law where he received his JD. Before he joined the Legal Academy, Professor Bowman had a quite distinctive career as an attorney. He clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and then he went on to practice law in both Chicago and Washington, D.C., where he specialized in international trade and corporate compliance law. His, his scholarship and research has appeared in such prestigious journals as the Georgetown Journal of International Law, the Indiana Journal of International and Comparative Law, the Journal of International Law and Politics, and the Houston Law Review, among many others. He has lectured widely on topics of international trade and national security. Uh, most recently, he published uh, a book, Trade Remedies in North America, uh, which was published uh, by Clower Law International. Um, we are extremely pleased to have him with us, and as he's going to be speaking today, on the interplay of culture and international trade in South Korea. Um, we'd like to welcome him very much and look forward to his comments. Thank you very much, Dean Vidic. Uh, and thanks to all of you for coming today to hear this second in the McDougal Global Perspectives Lecture Series in 2010 at the West Virginia University College of Law. It is an honor for me to be giving this lecture. It's an honor uh, for me to be teaching here at the law school and enjoying myself very much. And I hope today to give you uh, some interesting and stimulating food for thought on my chosen subject. My talk today uh, is on the interplay of culture and international trade in South Korea. Uh, I should explain at the outset why I've chosen this topic, why I think it is important for us to consider it, why I think um, we should talk about it, what I think we can learn from it. Uh, and I admit it's a very broad topic, and that means that we have only limited uh, time today to discuss it. So I'll try and hit some highlights uh, to discuss some key themes and then also leave some time for discussion and questions. All right. So the growth of international trade uh, in the past 50 years is truly one of the important developments, one of the most important developments of our time. International trade is, of course, not new by any means. Uh, trade and changes in culture have always been intertwined. History is full of stories of the impact of trade. The Silk Road, colonization, even the Black Plague. But modern international trade is of such higher volume, uh, such higher complexity, that it is easy for us to lose sight of larger trends and themes. One trend or theme that is often missed is the relationship between uh, trade and culture. That is, how might culture affect the direction of international trade? 
and how might international trade affect the development of a country's culture. So my goal for today, uh, I hope to provide some modest insight on this subject, uh, using South Korea as a case study. So let me outline what I intend to cover in my talk. First, I will talk about why I think South Korea is a good case study for this subject. Second, I will discuss a theoretical basis for considering the interplay of international trade and of culture. Third, I will discuss how that theoretical basis for interplay does indeed apply in the context of South Korea. And fourth and finally, I will consider what lessons we might learn, in particular what lessons might be applied to our current situation here in the United States and, in fact, in West Virginia with respect to international trade. For, as I will explain, uh, I do see many strong parallels between the situation right now in South Korea and the situation here in West Virginia. Remarkable similarities, in fact, overlooked similarities. So with that in mind, let's begin. First question, why talk about South Korea? Why talk about this land that is all the way on the other side of the world with a population of 50 million or so, 70 million if you include North Korea? Here is a close-up of the peninsula. You can see that it's sandwiched right between Japan and China. When we think of South Korea in the United States, what do Americans often think of? What do we think of when we think of Korea? <laughs> right? This is what we think of, right? Not even the movie. We think of the TV show. We think of Alan Alda as Hawkeye. We think of Colonel Potter. Not the original Colonel, but, but the better Colonel, in my opinion. Uh, we, we think of, of, of Major Houlihan. And there they are. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you spot the Koreans in this picture? No, you can't. That show really wasn't about Korea. It was about America's experience there in the war. And that's fine, right? It was a wonderful show. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But my point is that when Americans think of Korea, they're often not thinking of Korea itself. It is something that is uh, off the radar for many Americans. And when we do think of Korea, we're thinking of this guy. All right? Everyone knows who this is. This is the dear leader, the son of North Korea's founder, Kim Il-sung. This is, this is Kim Jong-il. So he is the dear leader, the son of Kim Il-sung, uh, the great leader, the founder of North Korea. This is his father, Kim Il-sung, signing the armistice between North and South Korea in July of 1953. Look at him. And he's, he's a good-looking dude, right? I mean, he's slightly cherubic. He had a winning smile, charismatic movie star, good looks. North, North Korea has, as, as you may know, the first hereditary transfer of power within a communist regime ever, right? Something actually that is deeply antithetical to the whole idea of communism. But that's what's happened. And indeed, it's happening again. We have a new sheriff in town in Pyongyang. We have this guy. This is Kim Jong-un, the 27-year-old son, third son, of Kim Jong-il, who is in failing health, recently suffered a stroke. Kim Jong-un is being called the young commander uh, in the North Korean press. He looks a lot like his grandfather, Kim Il-sung. He's got the same haircut. Uh, um, he's, he's a little bigger than his, his grandfather. Uh, but there's actually been rampant speculation in the South Korean press as to whether he's had cosmetic surgery to more closely resemble his grandfather. He's awfully young uh, in a society that uh, reveres experience and age to be taking power. So this may be something that is quite calculated. We don't know that for sure, of course. But there are a few pictures of him from when he was a schoolboy at a boarding school in Switzerland. He doesn't quite look the same. Uh, he certainly looks uh, a little bit thinner. The, um, uh, the interesting thing about Kim Jong-un, uh, I think one of them, is his size, his heft, right? He's a big guy. And in a society that has been racked by famine, over two million people died of hunger in North Korea in the 1990s. This fellow clearly has been eating very well. 
But I digress. I'm supposed to be talking about South Korea, right? So why talk about South Korea? Why discuss South Korea? My answer is this. The circumstances of South Korea really do make it a perfect case study, a near perfect case study, I think, of the interplay of culture and international trade for several reasons. Number one, for long periods of time uh, when Korea was unified, Korea essentially closed its borders to trade and cultural exchange for centuries. It became known as the hermit kingdom in the West, a situation that only changed once the Western powers and then later Japan started to turn their attention in the 19th century to opening Asian markets by force and also uh, colonizing them. So my point is that there's a long history in Korea of not engaging in international trade, a tradition that is continued in North Korea. Second, over the past 60 years, South Korea has become enormously prosperous through trade. In fact, one stunning statistic is this, that until 1975, North Korea was actually more prosperous than South Korea on a per capita GDP basis. The reversal of their fortunes has been breathtaking in its speed. Third, and related to the second point, is this. In the decades since the Korean War, uh, South Korea has seen radical cultural changes. Radical. The entire tone and tenor of the national character in South Korea has changed, and I will elaborate on that shortly in my talk. Fourth, South Korea's success is resulting in shifts in how South Korea views itself, both internally and in its relations with other countries. And indeed, it is changing how South Korea views its relationship with North Korea. And fifth, South Korea occupies, I think, a unique position in the world. It has strong cultural ties with North Korea, the world's most isolated nation, but very limited trade with the North. In contrast, South Korea historically has had much less in common culturally with the West. But it currently has a lot of trade with the West. Its attention is focused on the West. In fact, it's fascinating to go there and to look around at the foreign direct investment. South Korea has its sights set on the United States in terms of trade. So we can engage in a fair amount of comparing and contrasting here in terms of culture and trade. So with all of this, let's begin. And let's begin with some theory. Uh, I am a law professor. Theory is unavoidable. And specifically, let me talk about border theory, uh, theory about national borders. There is, of course, not a lot of time to get into this today, to get into the nuances. But uh, a, a brief conceptual overview is, I think, in order. There are different kinds of borders. We're used to thinking of borders like fences, right? You're either in the United States or you're in Canada. It's one or the other. They have a precise location. They serve to regulate ingress and egress. But there are other kinds of borders, too. There are frontiers in which national control of the territory sort of peters out once you get a certain distance away from the center. The American West comes to mind. And in fact, the uh, location of the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen was, until about the 1920s, not clearly definitively combined. And the maps from the era reflect that. There's no borderline between the two. And then there is the buffer zone, the no man's land, the demilitarized zone, the DMZ between North and South Korea is a perfect example of this. There's also the important concept of the permeability of borders. If a border is impermeable, well, then little passes through. The Iron Curtain during the Cold War was relatively impermeable. The border between the United States and Canada is quite permeable. The DMZ, again, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, is a highly, highly impermeable barrier. Here's a picture from inside the Korean DMZ. This farmer is not running the gauntlet. He's allowed to be there. He would not get through. I mean, look at all the barriers. Look at, look at the, the length of that bridge, right? You don't go through unless you're allowed to go through. There is, by the way, some farming in the DMZ 
Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively pristine environment now because of the lack of development there. So crops from there are actually in high demand. But not many people can get in, and you certainly can't get in without permission. This is another view from inside the DMZ. This actually shows the precise border. You can see in between the two blue buildings where there's gravel and then it turns into concrete. That is the actual border line between north and south. And you can see the South Korean guards who are all trained uh, with black belts in Taekwondo. You don't want to mess with them. And they are looking at a building in which the guards from the North Korea are staring right back at them. In fact, if we zoom, if you look at the top, you can see the North Korean guard uh, looking at us when I took this picture through binoculars. Impermeability pertains not just to trade and travel. It also affects the evolution of culture and of language. Over the past 60 years since the beginning of the Korean War, the Korean language in North Korea has diverged in important respects from the language spoken in the South. There's some different vocabulary. North Korean uh, pronunciation is more guttural than South Korean. And it is starting to be difficult to understand for some South Koreans. Some North Korean dialects are increasingly difficult for South Koreans to understand. In contrast, a highly permeable border, as I said, with the US and Canada or the US and Mexico results in greater trade and cultural exchange and perhaps greater cultural confluence. Now, I've written about the uh, subject of borders from a national security perspective in the post 9-11 era, and it is a fascinating subject. And I would submit that as the global economy becomes more service-based, with people traveling more, with economic development being less tied to heavy industry, which means that relocating economic activity is easier. Think of offshoring, for example, right? With levels of trade and goods and services continuing to increase, that means there are more vectors in the world for cultural exchange and interaction. A Hyundai plant in Alabama can expose Alabamians to Asian culture in a positive way. It brings jobs. U.S. law firms are currently banned from practice in the Korean market, but they will gain access at some time soon. And that will force significant and rapid changes in Korean business and legal culture. Even something as mundane as a toy can result in seismic shifts, seismic changes in culture over the long term. And I offer as Exhibit A my son, Ethan, right, who is seven uh, and a half, you can tell him I said the half. It's very important to him. Uh, he loves Pokemon cards, which are Japanese, but they, they prove my point. And he'll say something along the lines of, Daddy, look, I, I have an attack card for the dragon Bardicon. And he has 10,000 attack points. He has 2,000 defense points, Daddy, but only if he gets the flaming squirrel of death from the squirrel Nubaro. You all follow that? Right? To which I always say, wow, son, that is so exciting. That's really great. And the back of my mind is thinking, wow, son, I have no idea what you just said. Right? Seriously, how is this child going to think of the world when he grows up? Actually, he's probably going to think of the world in terms of attack points and defense points. Uh, but, but more seriously, how is he going to think of the world? How is he going to view the world when he grows up? Uh, in Korea, with thousands of students studying and living abroad, and having different experiences than their parents. What will happen to South Korean culture as these kids grow up and into positions of influence? Will they continue to fully respect authority and look to their seniors for guidance in accordance with traditional Korean Confucian uh, thinking? Or will they become more independent in their planning? Will they be less willing to work their way up the ladder of success, which is the Korean traditional way of doing things? Or will it be a combination of the two? Or will it be none of the above? All right, so I've talked about uh, why South Korea is a great case study, and I've set out some border theory as it pertains to culture, sort of a theoretical matrix for thinking about my remarks today. So let's talk about Korea, and specifically, let's talk about some of the huge changes that South Korea has seen in recent decades. This is Seoul during the Korean War absolutely decimated, all right? Here's another shot. As far as I can tell, this shot was taken about a mile away from where I live when I am in Korea in the summers. The bluff to the left gives it away. 
Now fast forward. This is a shot of downtown Seoul taken from the top of the faculty building where I live. The mountain in the center is Namsan, North Mountain. It's a national park in the middle of Seoul. There are a couple of interesting things in this particular picture. There's a building right here. You see the structure. It's kind of a green building that's built with open girders. That is a four-story golf driving range. How cool is that? Very cool. There's a church. It's hard to see on this one, but there is a church right here with a cross at the top. In fact, if you were to do a 360 from the point where I took this picture, there are about 10 churches in sight, churches all over Seoul. Christianity is the largest religion in Korea. It was not that way a generation ago. So it exceeds Buddhism at about 10%, Confucianism at about, I'm sorry, Buddhism at about 20%, Confucianism at, at 10 About 35% of Koreans are Christian. And it's evangelical Christianity, too. This particular church has, I think, eight services on a Sunday with more than 5,000 people total attending. It's an interesting group dynamic. Uh, there's a preference in South Korea for doing things in large, organized movements. It also may be uh, one of the things that makes South Korea so successful in recent decades, right? They're willing to be in large, organized mass activities. It also may be starting to hinder economic progress in Korea as well, not unlike with Japan in the 1990s. I'll talk more about that in a bit. But I'm getting ahead of my story. Look back again at the devastation. Look at this. Uh, this is another mountain in downtown Seoul. Utter devastation. And here it is today. I didn't mean to take the exact same photo when I took this, but when I realized what I'd done, I was stunned. We actually have, uh, there's a house, a large house with a blue roof called the Blue House. That's where the president of South Korea lives. I mean, look at that again. Complete devastation transformed, okay? It's a vibrant, prosperous, wealthy town, wealthy country. I would rather be lucky than good in taking photos like this. Here's some other scenes from around South Korea, from around Seoul, just to sort of drive home the point of economic prosperity. We've got shopping districts. We have shopping. This is Lottie Mart. This is like Walmart on steroids. One of the most interesting things I think you can do when you go to a country is one of the first things you do in the country is go to a grocery store. It gives you a lot of insight into the culture of the place. Here, we have three aisles of tea. It is a tea drinker's paradise. Right? It's a great place. This is my favorite street in Seoul. This is the toy market, where the discerning collector of Bakugan cards can find Korean language Bakugan cards. So South Korea is an economic success story, and in large part due to trade. Korea's GDP is, is about 90% trade related, but there's also a lot of domestic consumption too. What about Korean culture? Korean culture is rich, it is complex, and we could devote many interesting lectures to it. In our limited time today, however, I want to focus on one key aspect of South Korea, and that is the aspect of communitarianism. I, I don't want to pin too much meaning to the term for you philosophers in the, in the audience. It's perhaps a bit loaded. It is. Uh, sometimes used to define certain theorists who are in opposition to the liberalism of the philosopher John Rawls. But what I, what I mean to say is that in South Korea, and probably in the North too, there is much more emphasis on doing things for the good of society and far less emphasis on individuality than we are used to here in the United States in certain important respects. It's Confucian in that regard. You see the same thing in other countries, notably Japan and China. So in South Korea, you get lots of group rallies, like for the World Cup this, this past summer. The entire town was dressed in red for the games. You get group protests, too, like of the imports of U.S. beef. Uh, in 2008, every night for weeks on end, there were marches, 150 to 200,000 people every night marching through the streets, dressed in white, carrying candles. And the marches were actually quite peaceful. Uh, lots of families with small kids, small kids carrying candles, wearing white. Later on, when the families went home, then the trade unions would get violent. Um, but, uh, but not before then. It was, it was intended to be a large 
mass activity for anyone and everyone to participate in. And it brought the city to a standstill. Let me show you another picture of a wonderful group activity in South Korea. This is Korean baseball, and it is fabulous, right? Not for the quality of the ball so much as it is just for the whole experience. The teams are company-owned and company-named, so you have the Samsung Lions, you have the Doosan Bears, and you have the Latte Giants. Remember the store I showed you a few minutes ago? That conglomerate owns a baseball team. And all the fans come to the games, and they wear shopping bags on their heads. Those are shopping bags. Tie it in a half knot, you take the, uh, take the handles, and you loop it under your ears. And you sit there for the whole game. You see the far side of the stadium? See how they're dots of orange? Those are shopping bags on people's heads for the whole game. The fans also sing for the entire game, too. The home, fans, the home team fans sit on one side of the stadium. Uh, the visitors sit on the other side, and they take turns singing current English uh, language pop songs, typically English, sometimes not, but usually English language pop songs. They don't try and sing over one another. They compete. Okay, it's our turn. Okay, it's your turn. It's fascinating. The whole game, it is quite ordered. It's fascinating. And speaking of order, when you go to a Korean baseball game, you have to choose which side you're going to root for, right? Are you going to sit on the home team side or the visitor side, right? And when you walk in, and you want to buy you know, a hat or a shirt or other paraphernalia, you can only buy for the team for which you are officially rooting. Which strikes Americans as odd. We would think, couldn't the vendors sell a little bit more if they had the, the, the one-off Doosan Bears hat? But no, that would be not supportive of the cause. It's not about you. It's about the team. OK, so North Korea is prosperous. It's vibrant. It's booming. The situation in South Korea is even more stunning when compared to North Korea. This is a famous satellite image of North Korea, right? North Korean citizens are figuratively and literally in the dark. This is a wider shot. It's, it's embarrassing, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's stunning. Things are not much less depressing from the ground. This is downtown Pyongyang in the middle of the day. This is perhaps rush hour traffic for all we know, right? There's not much there. There's not much vehicular traffic. There's not much bike traffic. We can't say, oh, well, they don't have cars, so they're riding bikes. Some of the trucks look military, and there are hardly any people walking. Here's another one. Right, this is less than two years old. You can see the date, December 2008, or maybe not, but it's date stamped at the bottom. This is my favorite shot. That's a traffic cop. Enough said, right? Stopping, busy, busy doing her duty, stopping phantom cars. There's just nothing going on. It is a damning portrait. It's a society with little international trade, with a high degree of centralized planning that is disastrous, and leadership with little or no political accountability. All right, so where does that leave us in a consideration of international trade and culture in Korea? Uh, I want to talk about cultural changes as well as political and business culture changes too. So let's just start with culture in general. It is interesting to compare pre-war uh, culture in the South to post-war culture there. We have a radical change in South Korean culture over that time. Prior to the Korean War, Koreans were as a whole, I am generalizing, but as a whole, not as concerned with technological and economic advancement. There was order, there was a strong social hierarchy, there was focus on working the land, and not a heavy emphasis on industrial advancement. Post-war, this has changed. There is a direct and express emphasis on economic and industrial advancement. And there's a strong competitive streak that has developed in um, South Korean culture, both with other countries and internally within South Korea. Competition for the best schools, competition for the best jobs, far more so than we have in the United States. And all of this combined with a traditional Confucian respect for authority, desire for order, and a uh, strong communitarianism in the mentality have contributed to South Korea's economic development and 
the country's achievement of newly industrialized economic status. So we have this uber-competitive modern South Korean cultural streak. Not really a feeling of superiority. I'm not saying that. Uh, it's rather a, a feeling, a determination to succeed no matter what, which I personally find quite admirable. So we must ask the question, why the rapid change? Perhaps it in part comes from Americans who saw South Korea as a buffer state between the West and communism. There's border theory again for you. Perhaps it was the desire of certain leaders in South Korea to make their mark on history. Perhaps it was an instinctive desire to outdo the North. But either way, it is telling that it was rapid cultural change that was essentially top-down in nature. Second, it's, it's important and interesting to consider political changes in South Korea over the same period that cultural change was taking place. The cultural shifts in South Korea uh, that followed the war did not happen at the same time, were not matched for some time by political progress. South Korea was characterized for decades by rather authoritarian governments. A lot of recent change in the politics of South Korea can be traced to South Korea's hosting of the 1988 Olympic Games. In the 1970s, the government then thought up the idea of hosting the Games. Uh, that president uh, was uh, then assassinated, and his successor, successor Professor Chun, um, I'm sorry, President Chun, successfully lobbied to land the Games. By 1987, though, there was public discontent. There were growing demonstrations in favor of democracy. There was actually contrary to what sometimes happens in Korea, it was bottom-up pressure. And so in order to avoid jeopardizing the gains for the good of the country, the government pledged democratic reform, and President Chun agreed to step down. Let me tell a personal anecdote about this. This is um, a picture from last year when I was in Seoul. The fellow on the, 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 in the corner of the picture there uh, in the stripes is a guy named Daniel, who just, Dan just graduated from Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Um, he uh, lived in Korea. He is Korean-American. He went to grade school in Korea for some time. The other people, the guy in the red shirt is a former student of mine who's currently stationed in Seoul with JAG and his charming wife and his criminally cute daughter. Uh, but Daniel uh, told about what happened when he was in first grade. Uh, that was when the protests were happening. And on the way home from school, well, first in school, he would learn about the glories of Korea and how the government was, was working in the interest of the people. Then he would go home and he'd watch the protesters. Summer break then ensued, and after summer break, he came back to second grade, and the entire curriculum was overhauled. Right? Instead of learning about the former government, they were talking about separation of powers, political representation, democracy, individual rights. In other words, the opportunity to gain global attention through the games and the greater trade that might result from the games spurred political reform in South Korea. The protests matter, to be sure, right? But they would not have worked as leverage uh, if there had not been the desire at the top to continue to move the country forward. The leadership was willing to sacrifice to make that change to advance um, the cause of the country. And the change was then implemented from the top down. So now we have a constitutional court in Korea, along the lines of the South African Constitutional Court, Twenty years ago, the idea that a uh, law passed by the Korean National Assembly could be unconstitutional was an entirely foreign concept. It is now established as a firm part of South Korean jurisprudence. Individual rights cases are regularly litigated in an expansive sense. They're expansively uh, interpreted by the court. It is an infusion of Western liberalism into the legal and political landscape of South Korea. South Korea also has more popular representation, more democracy, and more political stability than it's ever had. What's interesting, however, is that even so, you still get the group mentality. Voting is by region. 80 or 90 percent of voters in a single region will vote for a single candidate. All right, so there's still this underlying cultural trend towards communitarianism. There are changes occurring in South Korean business culture, too. Um, business culture change lags behind political change, lags behind cultural, larger general cultural change. The business environment in South Korea is very much an old boys network. Things are very male dominated. Business is centered on family loyalty. The conglomerates, the chaibols, are family owned and run. 
Women who want to be career professionals have limited options. And for many professional women, they gravitate to the law, to the practice of law, because law tends to be more of a meritocracy than business, where who you know is more important, perhaps, than what you know. Now, there's still a glass ceiling, right? But it's an interesting shift underway. I also predict that you will see significant changes in Korean business culture in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, I think they're already underway. Young Koreans who have lived abroad, and those, some of whom I've, I've had conversations with in my summers in Seoul, they come, as they come into positions of power, they have a different mindset, right? They will perhaps focus more on what you can do and less on who you know. There will be less focus on business through socializing, I think. There will be less focus on business through Korea's um, very complicated and fascinating drinking culture. The rules for drinking in Korea are nuanced. Um, and a lot of business gets done over drinks. I think there will be more focus on results, which in turn, I think, will undermine the traditional top-down nature of the uh, business culture in South Korea. But it's not going to change until somebody gets to the top and says, you know what, we're not doing it this way anymore. All right, so what can we say about Korea's success moving forward in light of these cultural, these political, and these business changes? Korea's success to date has been in large part due to its culture, the willingness of its people to serve the greater good, to have a common vision, which combined with the development after the Korean War of a strong competitive streak has served the country well. However, the top-down nature of this approach is stifling entrepreneurial innovation outside of the conglomerate structure, sort of like what happened in Japan in the 1990s and continues to happen there. Koreans returning from working and studying abroad have tried to start businesses sometimes outside the conglomerate, the tribal structure, and have not been successful. Government does not support them. Uh, the regulations, the legal landscape is simply too difficult for them to navigate. So opportunities are lost. This is having a con consequence, adversely, I think, in terms of stifling innovation, stifling change, and advances in a rapidly changing, modern, high-tech, service-based, global, mobile economy. I do predict that South Korea will figure that out. The country has shown a willingness to rapidly and radically change in certain respects. Of course, in many cases, this change has come from the top down, but I think that that will continue to happen. I think South Korea will figure it out. And this is, hap this is happening in other contexts in South Korea. For example, this. This is a proposed English language enclave in South Korea. South Korea is responding to the cultural pressure that is being imposed by families sending their children to study abroad. And a lot of times the families split up for years. One parent, typically the mother, will take the children abroad. The father will stay home and work. This puts enormous pressure on those families and on those children. For, for some, the desire is simply to learn English. For others, it is the, the desire to gain full English fluency and perhaps to take their children out of the highly competitive Korean educational system where you will go for eight or nine hours a day and then go to a private, um, a private academy, a hogwan, to receive another four, five, six hours of instruction. Uh, my friends, who were in college there, talk about how they studied 15 hours a day. And it sounds like an exhausting way to spend your high school career. So there is pressure here, and the government's response is to do this. This is not underway. This is proposed. But there's serious discussion of it, a town in which you can only speak English, right? It would be self-contained. That's a radical solution. I mean, I, I have trouble imagining that we would do that here in the United States. But it is a revealing insight, I think, into the Korean psyche, uh, into the country's determination to succeed and to change their own rules about how they do things if they do not. Another interesting way I think that uh, Korean uh, culture and international trade will play out over the coming decades concerns the South's relationship with the North, and in particular with respect to reunification. The official South Korean policy regarding the North is that the countries are 
one country divided. And South Korea has many, many monuments that movingly evoke the sorrow of division and the desire for peaceful reunification. This is a shot of the Korean War Memorial downtown in Seoul with some incredibly cute kids in the foreground going to see the memorial and learning about reunification with the North. This is a monument at the War Memorial. It features two soldiers standing on a fractured dome. The smaller North Korean soldier is collapsing into the supporting arms of his larger, stronger South Korean brother. This is another monument at the, North, at the, at the Korean War Memorial. It is a plowshare that has been split into two, into two swords. It stands in a basin around which statuettes or statues of North Koreans and of South Koreans struggle mightily in opposite directions. Here's another sculpture. This one is from within the demilitarized zone. It is a sphere that has been split in two. Inside it is Korea. And people on both halves of the split are striving to put the sphere back together, to reunite the halves. I myself personally find these representations to be quite moving. For me, as a son of West Virginia, uh, it evokes echoes of the American Civil War. So officially, everyone in South Korea is in favor of reunification. But if you get people talking off the record, the story changes a little bit. Uh, there is a desire for reunification in the abstract but there is growing concern over it. It would be a severe financial impact that would amount to trillions of dollars over years and years. The current president of South Korea, Lee Myung-bak, has proposed, just proposed in August, a reunification tax to help finance the cost of reunification. I think that would have to be quite a high tax. Consider that Germany is still adjusting to its reunification two decades ago. And at the time of its reunification, East German GDP, per capita GDP, was about half of that of the West. And that was a severe financial strain. The North Korean per capita GDP is 2.5% of the South. 2.5% in falling. The North is an economy in decay with no sense of the modern world, with people without a modern skill set. It would simply be financially crippling to the South to reunite. And when you combine that economic impact with the increasingly divergent cultures of the North and the South due to the impermeability of the borders, you reach the conclusion, I think, that South Koreans are changing their mind about the North. That maybe they are indeed two separate countries for good. I think South Koreans are conflicted over this. I think their cultural and their historical desires are in conflict. And the North offers a stark contrast, right? The South has gained international global relevance through its trade. It is one of the United States' top 10 trading partners, one of the top 12 economies of the world. It is relevant. The North, economically irrelevant. What has the North done? In an effort to remain relevant, it is bellicose. It is belligerent. It is predictably unpredictable. And I would submit their strategy has worked brilliantly. When I put up the slide of Kim Jong-il, you all knew who he was. Does anyone know who the Queen of Denmark is? The leader of the government in Bangladesh? No. I thought not. All right, so lessons to be learned. To wrap up quickly here and take time for questions. Uh, there are several lessons I think we can learn here in the United States. One is the mutually beneficial relationship in South Korea between business and the government. Uh, it's not an equal relationship. Government is, is senior, but it is an interesting partnership, and it is interesting in several respects. The dynamic, for one, is not the populist, antagonistic, us versus them dynamic that we find all too often in this country on both sides of the political aisle. The dynamic is not one of government getting out of the way, right? Instead, it is one of the government paving the way and having business do the development. It is a partnership. Now, this happens to some extent in the United States where laws set the rules, um, but it is, it is of less programmatic and strategic. It is of a less programmatic and strategic nature than uh, in South Korea. Uh, right now, in the United States, there are competing views about what our federal government should be doing or should not be doing, right? It's a, it's a vibrant debate. 
I think until we resolve that debate, until we answer that question and reach some consensus, I think, personally, we are hindering ourselves in terms of economic progress and international competitiveness. And in terms of the things that we have done successfully and not done successfully in this country, um, in terms of the things that South Korea has done successfully and not done successfully, um, I think the answer lies in looking at those facts. So my point is that in South Korea, there's a consensus that has been reached, albeit a top-down one, about what we need to do, what they need to do to improve the country. I think we can learn something from Korea in that respect. Uh, the American process would be less top-down, but we do need to reach consensus uh, on this important point. Another lesson is that in the modern world, international trade is the path to future relevance. Look at South Korea. Look at North Korea. Uh, presidents, President Obama currently, the previous presidents going all the way back to President Carter, have consistently tried to revamp U.S. trade laws to grow U.S. international trade. It's not a Democratic or Republican issue. All presidents have reached this conclusion. The current administration is trying to do it as well. However, to date, all presidents have been hamstrung by competing interests. All of them have been unable to meaningfully revamp U.S. trade laws. And I just wrote a book on U.S. trade laws, and I can tell you with some authority, they are complex, and they are internally inconsistent, and they do not provide us with a strategic framework for advancing our country in terms of international trade. Now, um, this gets back to my point about reaching consensus and moving forward. Something needs to be done, right? Doing nothing is the wrong kind of something. According to a recent Q poll, uh, more Americans think China is the world's premier economic power than think the United States is. What about um, West Virginia, right? What about West Virginia? What lessons can West Virginia learn from South Korea's success? I think there are some striking parallels between our state and South Korea. We have a relatively small economy and land mass in West Virginia, just like in Korea. West Virginia was until recently fairly isolated. We have our own distinctive culture just like Korea. West Virginia is a place that has been, in many respects, dominated economically by its neighbors, and yet has strong cultural pride, just like Korea. In terms of our land mass, in terms of our population, this actually may make it easier for us in West Virginia to achieve consensus on issues that is possible nationwide in the United States. And this goes to my previous point about deciding what we want to be, deciding where we want to go. West Virginia being smaller may make such consensus easier. It may be possible, like in Korea, to get the political and the business actors together to reach consensus and to move forward um, in tandem. I realize, by the way, that that sounds incredibly quixotic. I'm unapologetic about it. I would like to think that we're grown-ups. I'd like to think others think so, too, that we could work things out for the betterment of our state. After all, having grown up here, I think West Virginians have pride in the state and a desire to succeed just like modern-day South Koreans. The question is what that catalyst for change will be. Will it be top-down? Will it not? Perhaps the catalyst is, is trade, right? Perhaps we can engage in greater trade. Right now, one in six jobs in West Virginia is trade-related. Perhaps it can, perhaps it should be greater. If we can harness what is good about our state, if we can harness the cultural pride, our strong work ethic, just like South Korea, and we fuse that with decisions that are designed to promote greater in-state development, resource management, education, and training. Perhaps, over the coming decades, we can see uh, a renaissance in the state. I, I do think it's possible. That sort of policy and public uh, political debate about West Virginia's future is a subject to go into more detail on at some other time. We don't have time now, but I do hope that today I have given some food for thought. So let me end there. Let me say thank you. Or as they say in Korea, let me say, kamsamnida. Thank you. Or maybe I just answered everything, <laughs> perhaps. Or maybe they have torts. Yes. Uh -oh. I'm always 
uncomfortable about asking questions as the dean. Um, I think the, the presentation is fascinating, and I see the comparisons um, with our state. I'd like to talk more broadly about what you see going on in South Korea with, uh, for example, uh, safety and health of workers, protection of the environment, and how you think that relates to its uh, increasing power in trade. Uh, that's, a, that's a really great question. There is a greater reverence for the environment there. It's interesting that in Korea, part of it is due to geology, but when they come to a low-rise mountain, 150-foot high mountain, and they're building a four-lane highway, they tunnel through it. They don't blast it out. Okay? So when you're flying over Korea, you see these ribbons of road going in and out of mountains in order to maximize the green space. I mean, it's a very densely populated country. But they've, they've had to make that hard decision that we have, we've really not had to make yet. I mean, the United States is a fairly sparsely populated place in terms of its square mileage. In terms of worker protection, there's a great deal of worker protection. Um, there is, I think, less, a less developed administrative state in terms of worker rights or um, uh, addressing worker grievances because there's very much this top-down. But the top-down has been, you know, take care of your workers, don't expose them to toxic chemicals. I, tur I toured a steel plant this summer, which was astounding. 25% of the landmass at the steel mill was green. Trees, bushes, and whatnot. It was all automated. It was, it was astounding, the level of, of technology uh, and investment. So there's, there's not a... There is heavy industry in Korea. They, 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 they're, I think, the world's largest shipbuilder. They produce a lot of steel. Um, but it, it's not China in terms of exposing people to a lot of chemicals and a lack of safety. Um, there's essentially, whether it's fully justified or not, there's a great deal of trust placed by the populace in the businesses and the government. Um, and you know, it's a very different place. Than, than it was even 20 years ago. I mean, you don't see a lot of bikes. You don't see a lot of carts. You don't see, um, it's one of the most beautiful cities I've been to. Other questions? Yes. First off, thank you, sir. And second off, uh, I once saw a professional South Korean baseball team uh, eat their team meal. And first, the manager was, had his food first before anyone else. And after each player got his meal, he would go in front of the manager, do a slight bow, and say, enjoy your meal. Then, yes. Korean, I assume. Yes. And uh, so you, you hit on that earlier about how in South Korea they have such high respect for those with seniority or those with experience. Um, kind of have that here in America, but not that much. I'm assuming it's as much as it is over there. Could you not kind of, much. Yeah. yeah, could you, if you at least elaborate on that more or at least explain how that would translate into like a, a corporate climate? Like if there's an individual who's performed slightly in a poor sense for like five years, but maybe they think, well, we'll keep him off because he's been here for 30 years. So if you could just elaborate on that. I, I, I think, I, as far as I know, there's not a Korean version of The Office, and I think that's because it wouldn't be very funny. It would be Michael Scott saying, do this, and the worker saying, yes. And, you know, in the next episode, he tells him to do something else. You know, it, would, it would not be nearly as funny. There, there's, there's a lot less question. Um, and that gets back to the point about, you know, that can provide for efficiency in doing something. It may be the wrong thing, right? Uh, but but you, you don't get that questioning and blowback, which is, on the one hand, something that can stimulate uh, innovation, and on the other hand, can result in a lot of lost efficiencies. I think the trick is to try and capture both. And, and I think that what's going to happen in South Korea is as junior people who have studied abroad come back and try and assimilate back into Korean culture and have difficulty doing so, one of them is going to break through and say, my company is going to be different. And that's going to be interesting to see because it's going to be disconcerting for the workers. But if they say, this is what you do, your responsibility is to question authority, I want to be there for when, for when, that, for when that happens. Um, I'm not sure that I really directly answer your question. There are a lot of different ways that I could take it. Thumbs up. You're respecting authority. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you think that the incentives that the South Korean government gives to people to open business in North Korea are having any kind of impact on 
Yeah, I do. I mean, for example, the, the pictures I showed from the DMZ, everybody knows what happened this, the past, this past summer with the sinking by the North Koreans of a South Korean military vessel. Highest tensions between the two countries since the Korean War. The tours of the DMZ did not stop. Why? Because the South wants to show people what the North is like, and the North needs the hard currency. So tourists from, they don't allow South, North Koreans to do it, but tourists from Russia and China come and, and look at the imperialist, capitalistic South, right? Money talks. There is a, an industrial complex just north of the DMZ in Kaesong. South Korean companies go in, they have managers, and they pay the wages for the workers, which are pennies a day, to Pyongyang. Pyongyang wants the hard currency. They need the hard currency. In all the midst of this tension, that did not stop. Right? So um, I, I, think, I, think trade is, I think trade is the answer. Right? And if, if we can't expand trade with the North, it hamstrings them. Now, they may bite off their noses to, despite their face. That's been the consistent practice there over decades. And it's very Orwellian. It's more concerned about being in power than having much. Um, the lack of trade gives the, the West very little option in terms of dealing with North Korea, which is why um, the six-party talks are important, why having China there is, is, is vital, because Korea's lifeline, North Korea's lifeline, is indeed China. They're giving them heating oil, they're giving them food, they're giving them money. So trade's not much leverage, but it's about all we have. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to know what you thought about the role of U.S. multinational companies in South America. I mean, I'm sorry, in South Korea and mm -hmm. how that's influenced their growth in trade. Particularly, um, that question came about after watching the, sl the slide of the uh, proposed English only speaking, I guess, community. So is, is there a U.S. multinational cor corporation influence? And if so, which companies are, uh, which, which companies are the most influential? That's a good question, and I cut a lot of the slides with my pictures of KFC and Outback Steakhouse and McDonald's and Smoothie King. Anybody heard of Smoothie King? I'd never heard of Smoothie King. Smoothie King is there. I mean, 7-Eleven has a joint venture with CVS. 7-Eleven, your neighborhood CVS pharmacy. Who knew? So they're all, they're all over the place. I mean, Korea is, is culturally, militarily, economically focused on the United States. Right? Not much on Europe. They get their civil law tradition from Germany in terms of the structure of the Constitution, but economically they're focused on the U.S., and it's not just the big dogs. It's not just McDonald's and Burger King and GM. It's a lot of smaller countries. You walk through Seoul, you walk through Busan, you walk through Daejeon, some of the big cities there, and there is a direct, immediate, pervasive U.S. presence in terms of FDI. And, of course, there are a lot of Americans there, uh, working, a lot of Americans teaching English in Hogwan, the, 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 private, um, the private academies that students go to after the school day. So it's, I could go on and on and on. It's pervasive. It's absolutely pervasive. And that's changing Korean culture. I mean, it really is. And right now, Korea has figured out how to successfully sell in the United States. Who knows? Um, does anybody, uh, would anybody be surprised to hear that Samsung's a Korean country, a company? A lot of people think it's Japanese. Right? But Samsung, Kia, Hyundai, LG, I mean, they've figured out how to, to penetrate the U.S. market with their big companies. It'll be interesting to see right now the small companies don't have much play. But if you get entrepreneurial spirit taking hold successfully, if you get changes in laws to let innovators at the low end then later become the Google, the MSN, and, uh, the Microsoft, and the like, you know, look in 10 or 15 years for those kind of countries, companies, to be here in this country. Yes?
A lot of resentment. Yes. Oh, yeah, I think that's what's changing people's minds. And, and again, the, the government says, we're in favor of unification. And everyone says, yes, right? But they're thinking, hmm, lots of, I mean, trillions of dollars. I mean, it's a trillion dollar economy, and it will cost trillions of dollars. And perhaps the, the cultural difference will be even greater than the economic one, the idea of, of going in and reassimilating the two cultures. Because they have diverged significantly, because there's been very, very little contact. You know, North Koreans that come to Seoul have trouble assimilating into South Korean culture. You know, there are maybe 20,000 defectors. That alone costs several hundred million dollars to assimilate those people every year. That alone, 20,000 people. Now take 22 million. And an infrastructure, and a culture, and a government, and relations with China. I I'm, not sure it's, I'm not sure it's feasible. It's, it's on the path of being like China and Taiwan. Two countries, one country separated. Period. The end. Maybe not. But, but right now, that's the way things are going. But it's not politically feasible for um, the government to, to say no. That's what's happening. Other questions? Thoughts?